Golf Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the legal, the loyal, the regal, the royal Ronin Ralph, your master of ceremonies. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to T-U-R-N. The United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On today's edition of Ralph Reads, the next to the last episode, Volume 11 of Midnight, a gangster love story created by Sister Soldier. So let us all behave like we got good sense and let the reading commence. Chapter 50 I meant to ask you, Chris. How did you convince your father to let you come back to the dojo? We were all seated on the floor. The entire class awaited Sensei's arrival from the back room. It wasn't me. It was you guys. My mother kept saying how great she thought it was that you guys came to the church. Even my father was impressed that you stayed and helped add up all the receipts. To tell you the truth, he thought we were all back there playing and pretending. When he saw the figures matching up with his accountant's calculations, he respected that. He had to, Chris said. So, uh, are you back in the league? Because you know the blacks play the greens for the season opener. And I wanted to apologize for doing all the dunking I'm going to be doing on you, May the 3rd, I said laughing. You might be dunking, but I ain't going to be nowhere around, Chris said. I'm still on punishment. I can do the martial arts because my father thinks I already put so much training into it and he already put so much money into it. Besides... He thinks that you guys are good and have, uh, redeeming qualities, he said, laughing. But I can't play in the league, because my father says it's, uh, high risk. I can't even go out on weekends until school ends, and that's not till June 30th. He looked tight about that. I miss seeing her. I miss trying to talk to her. I missed her trying to talk to me. I missed watching the unique things she did and ways she went about it. While working, every now and then, I'd look out to see if she would breeze by. I resolved that until she was finished with that art show, I was on the back burner. I just told myself it was the same position she was in when I was hard at work at the wedding job. She handled it and chilled out with Uma. I could accept and handle it, too. I could tell Cho had been observing me. I guess it was easy for him to see I was a bit anxious. Holding his reliable old knife in his thick, swollen working hands, he took a side look at me and said, Japanese girl make you into nervous wreck. Friday evening after Uma and Naja were secured, me and Amir met up and went over to Chris's house. Since he couldn't get out, we went to him. His family was at church. He was home alone. We kicked back at first and listened to some music. Amir had some cassettes of new joints that weren't even released on radio yet. It wasn't so hard to get his hands on them since all of the rappers coming up were straight out of all our hoods and could even be living in the same building with us even after their joints were banging on the radio. Chris's refrigerator was stacked, and the cupboards, too, with juices, sodas, chips, and cakes. Seemed like they had more sh** than the corner store. All of us chose something different than the other to eat, and we made it ourselves. Nice house, Amir said as he made himself a roast beef sandwich. You over here living like a king. Don't you know better than to let some project n****** in your place? He laughed. This is my father's house, Chris said. Don't you remember the speech? Everything in here belongs to the Christian Broadman Corporation. That's Dad. If I want something, 
I got to start up my own business and make it happen, Chris said. It can't be that bad. You got more shit than what I got. And your pops pays your expenses too, Amir said. Hola, far as I remember, I'm the only one here who has to go to work in the morning. Amir, your pops pays your expenses too, I joke for true. Later we played ball in his court. While I shook Amir to the hoops, I told him, now me and you is going to have to work even harder to win that money. If we get it, we still got to cut it three ways. He laughed regular at first, then his laugh grew louder and louder. What? If me and Chris won in the league, you'd want your cut too, I told him. Yeah, but if he's not even putting in work in the league no more, then it's like he's getting more free gravy. True, but remember you said three is better than two. Two is better than one, I reminded him. What the f*** does that have to do with this situation? Amir asked. We gotta stick together. Watch each other's back. Keep our word to one another, I said, and sunk the ball in the net at the same time. Oh yeah? What about with you letting us in on what sensei been teaching you? You ain't showed us sh I turned to Chris. You got any rope? Yeah, in the garage. Go get it. I'll show both of y'all something. Chapter 51 Late Friday night when I got back on the block, everybody was outside like it wasn't almost 1 a.m. I couldn't miss Heavenly, seated sideways on the back of Daquan's Kawasaki. Daquan was deep in a conversation with one of his brothers named Damon. Full grown and 22 years old now, but Daquan was still telling him what to do and how to do it and how much heart and intensity to put behind it. You got something for me? Heavenly asked softly as I walked by. I didn't answer her or bother looking her way. I acknowledged Daquan instead. Hold up, let me get in your ear, Daquan said to me. I'll be back, I told him as I kept it moving. When I came back down, I handed him the gold chain with the heavenly pendant on it, wiped clean and wrapped in the plastic sandwich bag. I finally had a chance to get it out of my hands without stepping into one of her traps. Since conflict's only been dead for two weeks or so, she probably had not had enough time to start f***ing with Daquan's head and to cause a rift between me and him who'd been cool for all these years. Take this, I told him. I found it. It's cool, man. I know her. She don't give out gold. She collects it, he said with a smile. What was it you wanted? I asked him. Oh, uh, sorry I couldn't get up to watch your game. We had to work a lot of shit out at the wake. Some of conflict side bitches was up there fighting in front of his mom's. Superior was torn up about his loss. The shit was fucked up, he said. When's your next game, he asked. Next Saturday, May the 3rd, I told him. Brownsville Park, 9 p.m. Night game in the Ville, huh? All right, I'm in there. I see you got conflicts, girl, on your bike, I said without looking at Heavenly. War booty, he responded and gave me a pound. I wanted to warn him, but I didn't. I knew that he was street smart and used to dealing with the snakes. But she was a snake with no rattle and no hiss. She strikes, but there's no warning or clues. By the time a man finds out something is wrong, she has already injected too much poison in his system and he can no longer be saved. There was really no way for me to express it without it seeming like I had something to do with her. Chapter 52 I was speaking to Tamara Orange last night, Uma said at the breakfast table after Fajr prayer early Sunday morning. She wanted us to come by her house tonight and discuss an idea that her husband had for her and I to do a culture class for the Sudanese daughters who are growing up here in America. 
she said that people would pay to have their daughters properly trained and are scared to death of the changes they are seeing in their children who are being raised living in this country what do you think about a class do you think it's good business i'll come home from work and take you to their house this evening let's sit down and see what they're talking about i answered it was warmer today than it had been any other day this season no use for a jacket hoodie or sweater the sun took over the sky flaunting its power i knew it was a good day when at around noon cho mashed his finger onto his picture on the wall the one with him standing at the helm of a fishing boat in the middle of the atlantic ocean and asked me you coming i smiled and answered no doubt yes or no he asked again most deaf i told him what yes joe yes i would like to come along on your boat when are you taking it out on u s memorial day the whole day me brother chan brother yin and you he said i was ecstatic nine months of dedication and hard work had finally brought forth the invitation i wanted to receive from the start it was the birth of a real camaraderie between Cho and I, outside of cutting and cleaning fish and hauling boxes. At quitting time, I was feeling sticky. It was too warm to wear my usual heavy rubber apron and plastics over my clothes, so I rocked today with only a t-shirt and jeans. My welding glasses were dangling from my neck. My gloves were stuffed in my back jeans pocket, and I was sweating some. I washed the guts off my counter and hosed everything down. In the bathroom, I washed my face, arms, hands, and feet just to cool down, feel comfortable, and smell good enough to ride the train. At home, I would jump in the shower before taking Uma to Mr. Ghazali's house. My gun was stashed and locked in Cho's basement. Downstairs, Cho's cat must have been feeling the heat. She was giving up a constant purr. Or maybe she was just talking to the other two new cats who were trapped in the cage while she was walking around free. Maybe she was trying to figure out how to get her boyfriend out of the cage so they could make sweet, noisy love in the dark corridors of the basement. I laughed at my own imagination. When I reached down to soothe her by stroking her coat, I plucked the rose petal from her fur. It flicked off, and I thought it was a strange find. A flower blossom in a cement cave? At my locker, I shined my key light to get my combination right. I unlocked the lock, put my glasses back on the top shelf, and checked for my nine. I took off my t-shirt, put my gloves on the top shelf, and reached for a clean tea when I thought I heard something. I stood silently to listen. Maybe the people next door were moving something on their side. When I got silent, the noise I had heard turned to silence also. I put my nine in my pants and took a short walk around. I ran up on a camper's knapsack, the kind the student tourists used to wear back in the Sudan. Theirs were packed and stacked and looked like they were carrying their whole life in the compartments of the sack held up by two metal bars. They even had rolled up blankets and thin bedding on those things. I got serious thinking how I always thought this underground place was a great hideout. If someone were on the run from the police, they would never think to check in the Chinatown underground. In the winter, it would be torture. But now that April was coming to its end, the floors were heated. The air was warm and thick, and the water underground ran hot, producing a steam room effect. There was a toilet. If someone had a grill or a burner, they could really escape from the clutches of the law living down here. The only thing missing was windows that led to the sky, moon, and the stars, and of course, the light of the sun. I decided to walk back upstairs and ask Cho if he knew about the camper's knapsack down here. When my foot hit the third step of the 15-step staircase, I heard the shower water turn on, and that sound was definitely coming from Cho's section. What was I bothering Cho for, I asked myself. I'm the one with the gun and the lethal feet and hands. 
I walked down the three steps and moved carefully. I was trying to think like the trespasser. Maybe he turned on the shower to make me think he was still in one area, but had really moved somewhere else. Maybe he wanted me to walk up casually so he could catch me off guard and bang me over the head. I was up against the wall like a detective. Cho's cat was looking at me like I was an asshole. I figured if the cat would run down the corridor, the trespasser would expose himself out of fear that someone was approaching. But he so saw the steam coming from the stall around the corner, which we both could not see into because of the way the stall was positioned. As I inched down the corridor, making it up to the wall of the shower stall, I checked on the right side of the darkness before turning left into the thick of the steam. A silhouette was seated in the corner, clouded by a full blast of continuous steam. It was too pretty to be an invader. It was Akemi. She laughed softly, covering her mouth to lessen her voice with her hand. The sound down here multiplied and bounced around the walls. I put my nine away, reached around, and turned off the shower water to lessen the steam. I wanted to see her clearly. The water splashed all over my bare chest before it shut off. As the smoke cleared, she was really there, wearing a paper-thin light beige dress, wet and pressed against her exquisite body. She had no shoes on her feet. Her diamond toe ring glistened. Her legs were twisted in a simple yoga pose for my pleasure. She was seated on a fluffy blanket. On top of the blanket was a white linen cloth and had a load of rose petals. She had made a bed for us in a hot cave below the streets of New York, surrounded by steam. I loved it. Mayonaka, she said, and placed her hand gently on the linen cloth beside herself, asking me to come over without words. She didn't even have to ask. I approached her, bent down, and laid my gun pointed away from her in the corner. I could feel her fingers tracing my bare shoulders in the dark. My eyes were adjusted now. She ran her hands slowly over my neck, and both her hands were now exploring my face like a sculptor. She went down my arms like she wanted to be familiar with each and every muscle and groove in my body. She began caressing my chest, then let her hand be still on my abdomen. I stood up and removed my pants, my shorts, and my socks. I lifted her off the bed and carried her into the shower stall, where I switched on a dim yellow light. I wanted to see her. I wanted to see everything. And I wanted her to see me too. See everything. In the soft yellow light, she leaned against the wall in her paper-thin dress, which was held together by only three white strings tied like shoelaces on the side of her body. Pull the string and the dress unravels. Incredible. When the thin cloth fell to the floor, her dark hair lay on both sides of her pretty shoulders. She was the definition of art. As my eyes moved down her body, some delicate and intricate body design was revealed. At first, I thought it was an expertly drawn tattoo. Within seconds, though, I realized it was Sudanese henna. She had drawn a henna belly chain, each link life-size and perfectly situated from her navel leading around her side to her back. The design was so perfect it clung and hung and rolled her curves like a real piece of jewelry. I spun her around and the design wrapped around her tiny waistline. Like a real chain, it had a clasp which was drawn above the split of her ass. She put her arms up on the wall she was facing, stretching the length of her body so that I could get a rear view. She pulled her hair, which had now spilled down on her back, to the front 
so I could see the detail of her second design. It swirled up and around her spine, a vine with tiny leaves. The design ended with a drawing of two small leaves resting at the nape of her neck. A Japanese spin on a Sudanese tradition unlike anything I'd ever seen. No henna hands or feet. Henna for even sexier secret places. When I looked up amazed from admiring the curve of her back and the wicked canvas her skin made for her artistry, she turned only her face towards me. I leaned in and kissed her. Her body slowly turned to face front, her nose wind fully extended and brushing up against my chest. She had her eyes locked into mine. Please. She whispered and smiled. I decided she was the sneakiest feline roaming around down here, and I knew she felt she had waited too long for me to give her what she wanted. With the palms of my hands pressed against the shower walls and her tucked in between them leaning, I kissed her mouth gently. Every time I kissed, she sucked. I felt and heard her breath escaping. Suddenly, I felt her soft hand feeling the length of my exploring the with such a light touch and moving down the length of it, not resting until it was beneath my I heard all she started that she sucked my tongue, licked my lips, and even licked my face. Her tongue was so nice, not too wet or dry. Breath fresh like she was sucking rum candy before sucking me. Now I was glad I had washed up already. I wanted it to be good for her in every way. I sucked her neck, feeling like it was mine now. I had one hand softly on her throat. She whined a soft sound. I moved my hand down and felt her shoulders in awe of Allah's design of women. I felt the soft skin of her arms. Both of my hands held her waist. I worked them back up. I explored her breasts, touching them lightly first without looking. It felt like they belonged in my hands. I pushed her back against the wall so I could see them. In this yellow light, the skin of her t were beige. Areolas were brown. Her n were tan. I licked and sucked them. She put her small hand over my big hand and pushed my hand down in between her legs. Her leg muscles relaxed and her thighs opened up to welcome me. With my fingers, I felt her miso muscles throbbing on the inside, and I found her tsirostic. It was not a little button. It was long, and more like a two and a half inch sliver of flesh shaped like a piece of yarn. I caressed it with my finger, and her whole body dropped down to the floor as if she could no longer hold herself up because of the pleasure. She was squatting down with her legs opened and inhaling and exhaling, breathing hard. I lifted her up and switched places with her. I sat down on the shower stall floor. She stood before me. Her piece was directly in front of my mouth. I smoothed out the silky bush and used two fingers to spill in the wall. I put my zero on us as I had yearned to do. I sucked it gently. She put her own hand in her mouth and bit down on it to lessen her whine of pleasure. Still, I could hear her. I had both of my hands gripping her buttocks so that her zero would stay pressed on my mom's niggas. I tickled her with my tongue and she exploded. I released her cheeks, and she fell back against the stall wall and collapsed down to the floor where I was. Her head was hanging between her own legs. Her hair was almost dragging. 
I lifted her face and brushed her hair out of my way. I licked her earlobes and stroked the hair on her head. We started kissing once again. I needed to go in her house now. It was urgent. She felt it too, I knew. Without standing up completely, she straddled me. We were both facing one another now in the sitting position. Then I raised up, using both of my hands wrapped around her waist and eased and lowered her body onto mine. I placed a pitch helmet this at the entrance of her easel. She was so petite. I didn't have to teach her nothing. Instinctively, she just began to bounce slightly and softly in a circular sort of motion as her very moist but very tight button he so little by little and clung to my head like a too tight glove. We rocked back and forth gently like playing on a seesaw. I felt her skin rip open and my head pushed most of the way in her but I saw with my hands gripping her waist, I pushed her from her hips downward so I could get the lat her for the snitches where it was meant to be. When I was near with all and hit her bottom inside, she gasped. I grinded her while she eased up and down, up and down, breathing harder and harder like she was on the ride of her life. The pole controlling all of the motion. Her mouth dropped and her head was tossed back now. Our hips were doing all of the work. Me, I felt something that I never had before. It was a sensation so sweet and so strong, like the thrill of being yanked up in the air at an extreme speed and tossed around in the sky with the stars and allowed to fall down to the earth with no parachute or protection. Her womb was the perfect place, and it gave me the perfect feeling. There were no problems inside of there. It was a hundred percent pleasure, a hundred percent peace. It was impossible to imagine that there was any place better. It was warm and soft and moist. It was tight yet long enough to take it all. And with the friction of each of her inner muscle movements, I felt a higher and higher sensation. I grinded harder. She bounced a little more swiftly. It was skin to skin, flesh to flesh. No condoms or creams or sponges or injections or pills or plastics or patches or contraceptions. When the energy built up so strong that I could not hold it back any longer, I spilled her host knits the snow kneeling look and the rocket ride dropped down as if it was out of fuel. Yet even the drop was a surge of pleasure. I could feel her fluid and mine oozing out as my dick slowly began to relax. She threw her whole body over my shoulders and just lay there trembling on my back. When she climbed down, she sat beside me in the shower stall. She threw one leg over my leg comfortably. She took one of my hands and put it down there. It seemed like she was ready to go again. But what she wanted to show me when she pulled my hand back was the blood on both our fingertips coming from her. Not a quote-unquote river of blood. Not thick goops of blood. Not stinky or fishy blood. Just slight thin blotches of watery blood. The kind I needed to see. The blood that was not there when I first held us. She picked up her white linen cloth and dabbed the blood from herself onto it. She waved it like the Japanese flag, white with a large red dot. She held up her hands like a runner throws their hands up at first place at the finish line. I thought to myself, 
What a strange girl. But I loved everything weird about her. She was my wife. She lifted her right leg and used her toes to turn on the shower. We were both standing now, the steam building and rising. The heat was intense. She began to wash my body with her hands and my bar soap. Seeing her naked, soaked, and wet was erotic to me. So, we did it again. I held her up and pressed her back against the shower wall. I stood and rocked up her nip. She bit her lips and climbed the walls. She moaned so much, I thought I saw piece of the cat running up and checking on us. The water poured down heavy onto my face and body. The steam hid us from the no one who was down there. Making use of the bed she made for us, I lay down like I was in the private room of a fine hotel. My first ever full-out sexual encounter caused me to feel so relaxed and so free and so damn good I wasn't worried or thinking about anything or anyone else. As she climbed back on top of my naked body with her naked, soft, and shapely body, I felt my joint stiffen again. I could feel her heart beating in her chest. Or maybe it was mine. I could feel her hair brushing against both of my shoulders. I flipped her over, and with me back on top, I just grinded her slowly, pushing it in the air with all, using even the muscles in my toes. Her piece of muscles were throbbing wildly like a second heartbeat. Her body lost somewhere below me. She could not get enough. I thought my weight might be too much for her, but she wrapped her legs around me like a frog and just flowed. She bit my shoulders and scratched up my back, but even the abuse felt good. I put my passion prints all over her too, even between her thighs. I was catching on to how to know when she reached Miss Agro. She would shake all over, as though it was beyond her control. Her entire body would be trembling. A whining sound came from her belly and rose through her chest, throat, and out her mouth. If I didn't know it was pleasure, I could have mistaken it for the sound of crying. When I rolled off of her and onto my back, we were both lying down facing the ceiling. She pulled my hand back between her legs and smiled. I told her, no more for you. Somehow, she knew what that meant. I gave her a kiss, and when our tongues touched, I started touching her up again, naturally. I just kept looking into her eyes and kissing her lying there. She just kept licking and kissing me, too. It was like a magnetic pull. We couldn't and didn't want to get off one another. I felt like I couldn't move, like my limbs weighed a hundred pounds each on their own and my whole body a ton. We took another shower, eventually. We watched each other dress in fresh clothing. We packed up our stuff. We were both leaning on opposite walls, staring at one another, fully clothed in the dark cave. Our eyes were filled with feelings and both our lips were wet. We had to calm down the constant throbbing below hers and mine before we could raise up to leave. I got off work at three. Now it was six o'clock. Come on, I told her. She tucked herself under my arm. We walked up the stairs and out through Cho's. He took his eye off his business for one hot second and watched me leave with the huge camper's knapsack on my back and Akami's fingers folded into each of mine. We left the bed she made and the rose petals she spread in the downstairs corner. Later, Cho, I said casually. I was too relaxed to think or care. 
Outside, we walked the other way instead of passing her uncle's shop. I don't know what I expected or what she expected. I stopped and pointed in the direction of her family store. She shook her head no and clung to me. In the train, she was all over me, and I liked it. Since we made love, it seemed like we could not unglue ourselves. One minute our legs were touching, then our hands, faces, and feet. We were stuck together and could not peel ourselves off. When we came through our apartment door, Uma looked at me, a long gaze into my eyes. She looked at Akemi, a long gaze into her eyes. Akemi lowered her eyes. Naja ran out and gave Akemi a princess's welcome. Are you ready? I asked Uma. We are both ready, Uma answered in Arabic. In my bedroom, I put down Akemi's camper's knapsack. When I turned around, she was right there behind me. The energy was so thick between us that I didn't want to go anywhere. I wanted to stay right there locked in my room with her. Even if we didn't touch, the feeling of the love and the energy that swirled around us would have been enough. But I promised Uma, so we prepared and went by taxi. Chapter 53 I saw the shift in Sudana's eyes when she saw Akemi walk in. Now Sudana was like a pretty wide-eyed fawn looking at a wild cheetah passing by and estimating the danger it might cause. I knew that she liked Akemi, except she didn't like seeing her with me. Seeing now the jewels Akemi wore, the jewels I gave her, including the ring, Sudana's eyes widened even more. She didn't say or ask anything. Her eyes went from the jewels over to me. She gave me one concentrated stare, then cast her eyes down and away from me. We were being separated for a time in Mr. Ghazali's house, the men from the women. Then we were all brought back together once again by the call to prayer. Akemi looked uncomfortable, but Uma scooped her up and let her watch from behind. I knew what Uma was doing because we believe there is no compulsion in Islam. At dinner, Mr. Ghazali, his two sons, and three daughters and wife Tamara, myself, Akemi, Uma, and Naja were treated to a Sudanese spread served not on their main dining room table, but on the floor using traditional low tables, carpets, and pillows. Sudana served Akemi with special attention and great hospitality. Her hand was steady holding the steaming kettle of tea and pouring it into Akemi's small teacup. I was grateful for how she was welcoming Akemi. It made me respect and appreciate Sudana even more. The simple new business deal was brokered. A cultural seminar for Sudanese families. It was good business, but really a woman thing. It was the only way for the African woman raising children in America to transfer knowledge, power, and common sense to one another. Tamara and Uma would host a class for the daughters of Sudanese families. The course would include learning our traditions and how to practice them in a foreign land, linking Muslim families together for mutual learning, respect, and support, converting culture into business, as Uma had already successfully done, cooking traditional dinners properly, because good food keeps the family strong together and peaceful, and increases the love between them, sewing, making perfumes, crocheting, carpeting, knitting, and even banking funds in a traditional sunduk, offering Sudanese families a method of saving, investing in, and financing one another. These were all things I had seen Uma do at home, naturally in our estate, in her building, where she met with her female relatives, neighbors, and friends. Back home, it was a voluntary gathering, not so organized and defined. 
But even in my young understanding of life at that time, I could easily tell it was something that the females looked forward to and enjoyed a lot. Miss Tamira was the connection to all of the Sudanese families whose daughters would come. After all, she and her sister-in-law had assembled hundreds of Sudanese families for Fawzi's Grand Westchester Wedding. The parents will be asked to pay out $50 per session since the information and training was priceless, and ultimately, each properly trained woman could easily open a competitive business when her coursework was done. Sunday was selected as the best day for the workshops above Naja's protest in support of our family day tradition. Once Uma assured her that she would be at her side as part of the feminine class, Naja accepted the time slot. The location would be Mr. Ghazali's finished basement at first, since it had a full kitchen and living area, as well as separate restrooms. When and if, Shala, the course became a success, they would consider moving into a commercial space or hotel hall. Everyone seemed content. I watched Akemi. I thought it must be difficult for her, not knowing English or Arabic, having to experience us in silence. Yet, she seemed completely at peace and content also. Before leaving, Mr. Ghazali said to me, I see you have taken a wife for yourself. Alhamdulillah! Please come to the mosque with your family and become part of the Amr. It will be difficult to have your Islam privately. We will need to support one another and praise Allah mutually. And if you haven't registered your marriage with an imam at a mosque, you should. It is your protection and our tradition and beliefs which outsiders and unbelievers will never understand. He embraced me. I embraced him. I had so much in mind for Akami, so much to share and teach and learn also, but I didn't think it required a rush. Weeks ago, after careful thought, I realized that Akami sees everything. It was Akami who said, Like you? Your religion is so beautiful. Since she was already beginning to see the beauty and rightness in our way of life, I felt she would move slowly and willingly and relax into the fold of Islam. This way, she would feel like she chose, not like she had lost something or lost a lot just to gain a man whom she loved. She had already fallen in love with me. Soon... She will fall in love with Allah also, Shala. Late Saturday night, all the females were worn from travel. Everyone took turns washing up in our one bathroom apartment. Uma lit the incense and seasoned the fish for Sunday breakfast. She soaked lentils, prepared dough, chopped cheeses, and washed then soaked beans for the fulu. Tomorrow will be your walima. She smiled with knowing contentment. We will have it for our small family, same as if there were twenty or fifty of us. Akemi looks even more beautiful since you went early. Isn't it? She's radiant. She's glowing. Uma said softly. What could I say in response to that? I kissed Uma, went to Naja's room to say my good night, and then returned to my room and closed my door. I kept me unpacked her clothes and placed them in small stacks. She lined her sneakers two pairs and her sandals two pairs and her shoes up against the corner wall. Her jewelry was in a neat pile on my desk, even her wedding and toe ring. I figured she was so used to her fingers and hands being free to create and draw and paint and that maybe this was why she removed all of her jewelry. On the floor, she stretched as I watched. She was completely flexible, as I had come to know. Within those yoga moves, open leg splits were simple for her. She could even be relaxed in a completely twisted pose. She loosened her silk robe of a thousand colors and dropped it down, but not off completely. She walked towards me and pointed to the side of her waist. I looked to see what she was showing. It was a birthmark. 
I see, was all I said. She lifted her bare leg and turned to show me her foot. She pointed to something. It was a beauty mark on the back of her heel. She smiled. I see, was all I said. She took her pretty foot down and laid down on my floor, dropping her robe all the way open. She pulled her knees up, then opened her legs. She pointed to the inside of her right thigh. Her finger was pointing to the crease that separated her thigh from a piece of... I looked. There was a beauty mark there also, in the softest part of her skin. I looked at her and said, You better stop f***ing with me, girl. She smiled. Then we made love. We made love right there on the floor. I had to turn on some music to drown the sounds of her pleasure. In the morning, I felt a sense of alarm. I felt myself sinking so deep in love, it was as though I was drowning, but wouldn't do anything to save myself. The love was in my heart, of course, but it was in my limbs, too. I could feel it in my arms, legs, and toes, moving in my chest and weighing me, holding me, all the way down. I could hear her breathing. And she could hear me too, I'm sure. The first sign that I was awake, she was already moving on top of me. I thought I heard her moaning only to discover it was myself. It was a feeling of complete ecstasy. But for the first time, I felt powerless. I was the same man, the same fighter, the same soul, but felt a love so heavy, I was surrendered to her. I was unfamiliar with fear, but now I feared any morning where I had to wake up any other way than this way right here with this woman right here. Our Wali Ma occurred on a Sunday, which was also family day. It was good to see the joy that Akemi brought to everyone. She was like a grown-up daughter to Uma, who she paid such close attention to and showered admiration on, and a big sister to Naja, who had already informed everyone Akimi had to learn five words in English every day. She occupied them, which freed me up some. I was grateful for that. Besides, I believed that women needed each other in this way. As Akemi finished washing dishes after a spectacular meal, Naja appeared with some magazine cutouts glued to a piece of construction paper. Where is Sachi? She asked Akemi. Sachi? Akemi repeated. Uncle. Akemi responded. Does Sachi have a bike? Naja continued, pointing to a picture of a bike on the construction paper. Hi. Akemi said. That means yes. I told Naja. Well, say yes then. She scolded Akemi. And let's go get Sachi. I want somebody to play with. She insisted, trying to hold Akemi's moist hand. I looked at Akemi. I didn't know the details of the status of her relationship with her people or my relationship to them either. If she wanted to go see her uncle, there was no problem in it for me. Sachi. Hi. Akemi agreed softly. Sachi, yes. Naja repeated in English. Hi means yes in English. Naja taught and then proceeded to say, Hi, yes. A hundred times until Akemi either understood or gave in. Yes. Akemi said that Naja was satisfied for the moment. We arrived on Sunday afternoon at her family store. She went inside first. Uma and Naja and I remained outside in the great warm weather. Akemi returned outside shortly, standing under the canopy with Sachi. Both of them began waving to us to come inside. Akemi introduced Uma and Naja to be her uncle in Japanese. He spoke stiff but polite English, saying, Hello, pleased to meet you, as he might say to one of his customers. Uma said in English, Very nice to see you for the first time, Mr. Nakamura. Her Arabic accent was heavy. 
To the Americans, I am told Arabic sounds like an overdose of Z's and S's. I hope he was satisfied with Uma's greeting because that was as much English as he was going to get out of her that afternoon, or at least for the time being. Akami's aunt appeared from the back room of their store. She spoke Japanese to Akami. Akami introduced Uma to her aunt. The aunt watched her so closely it seemed like she had something to say or ask, but she didn't. I thought it was interesting how they interacted with Uma, but not with me or Naja either. Akemi touched my hand and then said some words to her uncle in Japanese. He nodded. She spoke some more, standing happily at my side. It felt good seeing her wear her wedding ring and bangles in her presence. Naja and Sachi were in the background playing and speaking to each other comfortably and easily. Sachi was showing Naja some of the accessories their stole sold that she liked. I did hear Naja ask Sachi, Is that your father? What's wrong with him? Does he have a stomachache? Nope, Sachi answered swiftly. He doesn't like black people, but I told him you guys are fun. Well, there it was. Spelled out and spilled from the mouth of the two seven-year-olds. Only thing was, Uma and Akemi could not understand those English words, but me and the uncle could. I heard them loud and clear. He pretended he did not. Akemi spoke again to her uncle politely and softly. Sachi jumped up and down, up and down, up and down. Thank you, father. I knew it was only because of his soft spot for his daughter that he allowed her to come. I imagined that she had probably been asking for both Akemi and Naja over and over and over and over again the way little girls tend to press. Sachi ran in the back and came right out pushing her pink bicycle with the Hello Kitty logos all over it. In the Manhattan Park, Sachi and Naja zoomed around on their bicycles. They were laughing and smiling. The double burst of energy attracted other little kids who were already there looking bored with their parents or nannies. Soon, four or five other children joined them and the race was on. The women who supervised each of them screaming out, Be careful! in every language and dialect. Naja was out front, her head covering flying in the wind. Sachi was doing her best to catch up and edge her out. They were playing follow the leader. I had never seen Naja smile so brightly before. Behind the bicycles, kids without bikes began chasing. The whole park was converted into a children's paradise. When they ran each other crazy and grew tired, they ditched their bikes and climbed up the monkey bars, every child trying to be the head monkey. Uma and Akemi supervised them. I was sitting on the top of the back of a bench reading a book, noticing that I was one of the few young men in the park. I looked up every now and then just to be mindful. It was family day, so I had to pay some attention. In one glance, I saw Akemi pushing Uma, who was sitting on a swing. Akemi was excited, repeating something in Japanese. I figured she was telling Uma to kick her feet so her swing would take flight. When Uma started pushing her legs forward and pulling them back again and her swing picked up momentum, she smiled brightly also, her head covering on her pale pink thobe falling to her shoulders. She looked young and happy. Akemi jumped on the swing next to Uma. Naja and Sachi were already swinging beside the two of them. As I watched all four of the female swings fly higher and higher, their pure joy brought back that feeling of alarm. Perhaps Mr. Ghazali was correct. Maybe I should find the right mosque and join in. I would need to be a part of a brotherhood of men with similar beliefs and ideas and complete dedication to protecting their families from all of the definite threats that lingered all day and night, every day and night. How else would I be able to secure the three of them, all moving in different directions to schools and jobs all at once? 
How could I protect Akemi in the same way as I had always protected my mother? How could I be in two places at one time when I had already given my life to Uma and built my own world in response to what Uma needed and wanted? But then again, how can I not protect my wife also? My father had been a part of a brotherhood of men, a real one. He didn't have to leave our estate to go to mosque. It was on our property along with my school and everything that was necessary to have a secure community. But then life wouldn't be without the intruders, the invaders, men who work overtime to make themselves your enemies, who represent the threats that have to be stopped, eliminated, wiped out. I pulled my thoughts back and got them under control. When the girls finally exhausted themselves, pedaling, walking, running, swinging, and crashing into stuff, we went for ice cream. I sent all of them inside the store and stood outside watching the bikes. I dropped Sachi back at 6.30 just to maintain a decent amount of respect. I have a half hour left, she said to me with a smile after Naja informed her of this fact. We'll come and see you again sometime, I promised her. Aren't you coming with me? Sachi asked Akemi. Akemi spoke back to her in Japanese, and she and Sachi conducted the rest of their conversation in their language. However, Akemi stayed clung on to my arm. I felt good to know that her family actually knew that we were together, married, and serious. Before I was thinking that neither side might really be having the full story. On the way back to Brooklyn, we stopped at the Open Mind Bookstore. I wanted to see if Marty had received my order. He was happy to see me, happier to see Uma, and surprised at the new edition of Akemi. He looked her over in an obvious but harmless way. When he and I were standing alone, he said, Who needs to read books? I'm having a great time just watching you live your life. Akemi came over with a book that caught her interest. It was a picture book on Japan. She flipped through the pages slowly, me looking in with her. She stopped on a map drawing and pointed out a city. She said, Kyoto, Akemi. Oh, yes. Kyoto, Marty said. It's the ancient capital of Japan. It's got great architecture. It's really a beautiful place. In fact, it is so beautiful that during World War II, when the Americans were going to bomb it, they picked another Japanese location to bomb instead, declaring that Kyoto was too startling and wonderful to destroy. That was very nice of the Americans, I told him. Have you been to Kyoto, Marty? I asked. Only when traveling through the pages of one of my books, he answered with a laugh. Do you have my order? I asked him. What's my name? He said back. I paid him $59 for a leather-bound Holy Quran written in the Japanese language. A gift I planned to present to Akemi, which was also listed as one of my gifts to her in our Ajid. I will not thrust it on her. I knew she needed and wanted to concentrate on her big show coming up in less than a week's time. In fact, I was surprised that she was spending all of this time with me now. Before, I was all worked up into waiting until after the show to have her all to myself. Naja also selected two books, while Uma was satisfied with flipping through the pages of an Arabic to English dictionary. I bought it for her. I guess she was thinking of her English language course set to begin on this upcoming Saturday. Big day. Saturday, May 3rd, I thought to myself, Akemi's art show, the start of Uma's classes, my workday at Cho's, and my opening game with the league. Different places, different times, one man. We took turns showering Uma, Naja, and then me. Akemi showered as we made prayer. In my room, I began organizing the events of my day for tomorrow. I had money on my mind. 
the possibility of the purchase of the house, which we really needed even more now. I had dropped a lot of cash since I began interacting with females outside of my family, I thought. I pulled out my cash stash box and counted up my savings. I went through all my pants pockets and organized my bills. I threw the stray change into the jars where I kept coins stored. Tomorrow at the bank, I would get the paper coin holders. At our apartment, I would roll up and count seven years worth of coins, figure out where I stood, and get more serious. In the midst of my push-ups, which I had tripled up on since I had neglected working out for the past two days, Ak and me came in smelling fresh. New night. New robe. I watched her as she moved around, putting her stuff in selected places. I also watched this sneaky feline watching me out of the side of her eyes. When I hit 360, I stopped. Remaining on the floor, I dragged myself to sit with my back up against my bed. She came over and threw one leg over my shoulder, sitting down behind my neck. Now both of her legs were dangling down. She laid her pretty feet, each one, on top of each of my legs. I put my arm around back and swung her body in front of me, still on my shoulders but facing me. I said, oh, all that hell he saw her us. I knew that's what she wanted. I was learning that she liked that right before I heard it when it It doubled and tripled her musagrope. I knew I was right because now as I heard us, she leaned her body all the way back and upside down. The top of her head was on the floor. Her hair spread over my feet, the feeling so immense that when she meh, she cried real tears. Chapter 54 Naja to the sitter, Uma to her job, Akemi and I to the bank. Akemi took a seat on a comfortable chair in the bank wing area. Same teller, the usual Monday visit. She accepted my deposit, looking only at her own hands, counting the small sum of money. She stamped my passbook and slid it through the slot. She glanced over at Ak and me and said to me, Are you serious? Let me get some paper rolls for pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters, I asked. She rolled her eyes, then hesitated. Please, I added. She gathered them and passed them to me. We left. Some of these black American females are funny, I thought to myself. They don't know how to carry themselves or treat a man good, as if f***ing is all there is to it. There's no sweetness in them. They stay on attitude all day long. Then they get mad when a man treats any other woman special. That teller had been seeing me around and knowing me for at least five years. I barely ever got one sentence or half a smile out of her. So why was she in my business? Why did she care who I loved? Akemi needed to make a stop in Queens. I took her to her uncle's house, even though I knew he was not home and that they were already in the family store and Sachi was already in school. I still didn't go inside his place. When Akemi finished up and returned outside, I was sitting. She pulled the flyer from the MoMA out of her front dress pocket. She pointed at the name of the museum. Today, eight, she said, having learned a bit from Naja, who had her own way of making her lessons stick. Tonight at 8 p.m., I asked her. Tonight, 8 p.m., she corrected herself with a smile. I knew that's when I needed to pick her up. I also knew I would have to miss Dojo tonight to be on point with Uma, Naja, and her. After I dropped back and me off, I headed down to the lawyer's office about the house. 
Well, you look relaxed, the lawyer said. Did you have a good weekend? I'm good. I smiled and thanked her. Okay now, the inspection has been completed. It's an old house with a few problems, nothing major. But you knew that already, didn't you? I knew the house was old, I agreed. Well, the wiring on the house, the plumbing, the structure itself is great. Sometimes these old houses are built much stronger than the new ones. The new ones can easily be all cheap wood, drywall, and sheetrock. Somebody lights a match, then poof! The whole place blows up in minutes! She dramatized and laughed at herself. The inspection reveals that you may need to replace all of the windows. They suggest especially the ones on the first floor. If this is something you can do in the summertime when you move in, you will end up saving yourself a heap of money on heating for the fall and winter. Windows, I repeated aloud, thinking. Also, the roof of the house was replaced, um, two and a half years ago, so that's good. This is a relatively simple buy, since you want to purchase the home without a loan. You've certainly eliminated the lion's share of the work. No mortgage fees, credit checks, high interest rates, great. She said, smiling, and folding her hands in front of herself. So we have the title search and the inspection completed. We can make our offer and sign the contract so that Mr. Slursberg can at least take down his for sale sign, keep the house off the market to other potential buyers. You don't want to get in the bitten war and have some other buyer drive the price up. She said, finally taking a breath. As much as I enjoy working together with you, since you are underage, which I find unbelievable, I will need you to come in with your mother. I know you said she has to work, we could set something up for, say, six o'clock this Thursday evening? She asked. That's fine, I answered. We'll give Mr. Slursberg a call then. I'll also set up your options for a home insurer. Of course you'll want to insure your house and property, right? She asked. I thought of Chris's father with the mention of insurance. Of course, I responded. Would you like to see if we could push the closing date up some? She asked. Closing, I responded. That's the day you actually pay all of the sums, become the owner, and receive the keys to your new house. The way it sounds, I don't see any reason why Mr. Slursberg has the date pushed all the way back to June 1st. Oh, if you could see all of the junk he has in that house, I said laughing, you would know why he has that move-out date pushed all the way back. Such nice teeth, she said to me, then looked back down at the paperwork. Thank you. I responded. I leaned forward and dropped my head a bit, as I often did, to avoid meeting women's eyes. If you could get the date pushed up, that would be more than perfect. We really want to move as soon as possible, I told her. Seated on the wall outside her office, I was thinking numbers. 80,000 for the house, another thousand for the Closing costs, including the lawyer's fees, the home insurance costs, the house appraisal costs, the inspection costs, and the title search. Let's say we're at 81500 Let's say we're at $81,500. Then there will be the actual small house repairs, paints, and supply costs, and move-in fees. Let's say another $1,000. Now we're at $82,500. We've got $85,300 in our account. Once we buy the house, we'll have only $2,800 left. But the flip side is, there will be no more rent to pay, no mortgage to pay, no bank to seize our house when business got slow or tight. And peace of mind. I jotted down a note to myself. Property taxes, quote unquote. I forgot to ask about the amount we needed to pay for our property taxes. I hated that we had to pay them, but I knew that we would have no choice. It seemed like a legalized criminal way for the government to still be collecting some form of rent from a homeowner. They wanted us to pay for our houses twice. My personal savings, seven years of delivery tips, plus money set aside from nine months working at shows, and three loose diamonds given to me by my father, 
That was my total financial value. I took my assessment and used it as motivation to get my ass up and pursue the stream of new clients who had phoned into Uma Designs over the past week. I jumped on the train and did what I do, make appointments, keep appointments, conversate with clients, make arrangements, and take measurements. By 5 p.m., I picked Uma up. Then we picked up nausea. I secured them and went to ball practice. Chapter 55 Bang showed up to basketball practice that evening. She arrived earlier than usual, probably because she had figured out that last time I cut out early and avoided her. I didn't like her sitting around a gym full of sweaty male teens working out. It was not the same as bringing nausea. Bangs was all body. Everything she wore rode her deep curves and highlighted her beauty. Today she wore shorts and a tight tee. Her hair was slicked up and pulled tight, then rubber banded into a bun. She combed her baby hair down and swirled it out onto the smooth skin of her face. Her milky breasts also were a magnet. She was all smiles and sitting on the top back bleacher against the wall. Her dimples revealed her happiness. I looked up at her face and knew she didn't know that I intended to separate myself from her. I needed her to stop coming for me. After practice, I met her on the side of the bleachers and slightly underneath. Thank you so much for what you did, she said. Nobody in the whole world ever did anything so nice for me, really. She went to wrap her arms around my neck. I caught her by the wrists. Listen, Banks, you're cool with me. You look down and I won't forget it. But what you're looking for? As far as me and you, that's not happening, I told her. Why? She asked, seeming completely puzzled. We already discussed why, I told her. Oh, that's nothing, she said, referring either to my religion or my relationship with Akemi. It's something to me, I told her. I didn't mean it like that, she answered, lying, I thought, and now her new lie reminded me of her old lies. Who's Darren Sparks, I asked her. Who? She got immediately defensive. I don't know who that is, but if he told you I did something with him, he's lying, she said, within a half a second. Didn't you tell me your daughter's father got hit by a drunk driver, I reminded her. Her eyes started moving around away from mine. He did, she said softly, her voice trilling off and her face revealing her desperate rush to organize her thoughts and her lies. She stood still for the first time since I met her. Her dimples and her smile were gone. Suddenly, she tried to bring them back. Did my grandmother say something to you? She asked, trying to sound pleasant, but I knew what she was attempting to do. She wanted to find out how much I really knew so she could lie about whatever else remained. Is your grandmother your real grandmother? I asked her. Yes. She looked puzzled again. She's my mother's mother. Was, I mean. So is it my fault, Superstore? She asked with tears falling from both of her eyes. One of her feet started shaking. I was silent. Of course I didn't think it was her fault that some grown-ass demented man, a blood relative, went to young member of his own family, his sister's daughter. I thought it was filthy. In the Holy Quran, it spells out clearly, for all believing men, which women they are allowed to marry and goose newark, and which women are forbidden. It is forbidden for man to take his siblings' daughters. 
It is forbidden for men to hear. Still, men who are non-believers or fakers don't pause and are capable of great evil. They f*** it up for everybody. I also think that she couldn't be trusted. She cut out that random newspaper article and put it up on her wall, probably lied about it to every dude she brought up into the bedroom. She probably lied about it with a big smile and her pretty dimples and her skin glowing. And why was she keeping her uncle's dirty secret? Did she like f***ing him? And if she hated it, why was she still f***ing him? Why were his pants and the condom paper up in the bedroom same like it would be if two lovers met in a secret rendezvous? And why does she pretend to hate him whenever she saw him? Then in private, what? She would lie down for him and crack open her legs? The whole thing got me heated. I thought about killing the baby, she said. But isn't she pretty? She asked me in a childlike voice. I'm glad I kept her. I thought you liked her too. You were the only one who didn't treat me like my baby was my curse. I do like the baby. She's innocent, I said. I know. She said, smiling. I'm gonna get her out of that house before she turns five. That's how old I was when he caught me in the corner of my room. She folded her arms back across her chest and crossed one leg over the other and placed one foot on top of the other. She looked closed and uncomfortable or trapped in the bad memory. I couldn't protect her honor because it was already gone. I wouldn't want her to be the mother of my children. I wouldn't give my life for her or risk my freedom. I couldn't teach her too much because she was already too slick. And no woman could roll back from knowing too much or being too slick for the wrong reason to not knowing and not being slick even for good reasons. I was attracted to her enthusiasm and her comical happiness. Also, ever since I saw her in the daylight at the pharmacy and in the candlelight in her bedroom, I was definitely attracted to her body. It took everything I ever knew to keep off of her that night. I could feel that I was only seconds away from losing my self-control. And I knew that whatever I wanted to get into, she was wide open and down for it. But was it me getting her open? Or was she just open in general? I couldn't trust her movements any time I wasn't seeing her standing in front of my face. I knew she might be doing anything. Now, I didn't respect her enough either. I wanted her to stay away from me. Because, yes, I believe that the right or wrong moment, like any man, I can easily f*** her. But I already knew I would never f*** her without wearing a condom. If she chased me hard, I would allow her to be the first to hit me. I'm a thought that had already occurred to me and enticed me once, but I wasn't proud of. I would never be so or It wasn't a clean place. It wasn't my place. It was a public place, like an outdoor bathroom or bus stop. So she was right. I needed her to stay away from me for my own good, for my own sake. For the protection of the man I am and want to be. These were the thoughts that rushed into me. But for some reason, I was still angry even though I didn't know or understand why. Trying to get my head right, I took deep breaths to relax myself. Bang said maybe she would talk to someone else on my team. That shit was foul and dangerous. That shit got me tight. Since I didn't love her, I was asking myself, why did the thought of me knowing that she might start f***ing with someone else make me feel so heated? When I thought about someone else touching her, why did the thought come along with me seeing myself breaking some neck? If I wouldn't fight for her or risk my freedom, 
Why did I want to murk her uncle? I needed answers from myself. I was mad at myself for catching feelings for bangs. It was my fault, I decided. I take responsibility for it. Mad at bangs for being what Uma called a lesser thing. I wanted her to be smarter, stronger, better. I wanted her to be so much more so I could feel all right about caring for her. If I had to trade Akemi to get bangs, I'd throw bangs out of the picture. But my own father had the greatest woman, Uma, and still had two more wives. I never saw his love for Uma decrease or ease up or change in any way except to grow stronger every day. It seemed to me that real men are collectors of fine women and the possessions of their hearts and not destroyers or deserters. Only a fool will leave a great thing when you can always keep it or take it along with you. There are three kinds of men, I realized. There are the non-believers, the make-believers, and the true believers. The true believers' feelings are alive and awake. The true believers have hearts that rage. There is no such thing as halfway love from a true believer. When a true believer, a Muslim man, loves a woman, he possesses her completely, guards her with his life. He has high expectations for her, holds her as a treasure, the main ingredient, the spice of life, the wife, the mother. I had to confess to myself that I do not love Banks, but I could love her. As a true believer, my heart is raging. The more I would have seen her, talked with her, held her baby in my arms, given to her unselfishly, the more she would grow and become a part of my true heart. But then I would be pushed by my same raging heart to murder the man who violated her, to take her as my second wife, to cover up her beauty and charms, to teach her a better way of life, to become the guardian to her daughter. Once she changed the way she was living and I was in her bangs, me, this true believer, she would become mine forever. And anyone who tried to hurt her or seize her from me, I'd sever his head from his neck. And this is my gangster. This is my problem. I couldn't give a girl who wasn't steady that much love or that much power over me. As in Islam, any woman who is not mine by birth or blood relation or oath of marriage is a woman I need to separate myself from, is a woman whose body I didn't want to see, a woman who I should turn away from and lower my gaze. Make-believers are men who pretend that they have a belief in life. They lure women with their pretense and trappings. They make believe that they are Muslims, Christians, Jews, and any other faith. They make believe that they are strong. They make believe that they are capable of love. They make believe that they are part of a family unit. They make believe that they are protecting you. They make believe that they are real men. Non-believers are men and women who don't have to do anything. They have no limits, no boundaries, and no expectations, none for themselves, and none for you, either. Non-believers are the sons of a painful pair of parents who are either dead in the body, meaning they are absent or deceased, or dead in the mind, meaning they are present, but their ignorance only makes their presence worse. The mothers of the non-believers are prettied up mindless ho- the uneducated ones, and the well-spoken educated ones, too. The non-believers have no chance of real love, real family, or real life. Still, they are out here outnumbering us all. Meeting Bangs taught me all of that. Brought all these thoughts to mind. Uma says every woman 
who allows himself to interact with leaves her trace on him, good or bad. I am grateful to Bangs for these lessons, most of all to know the truth about myself as a man and to be loyal and true to it. I do sincerely apologize, folks, but we are going to have to pause for the cause because you folks got to tune in to the next edition, the finale of this story on Ralph Reed's. I would like or rather love to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. You may connect with me via Facebook. Send a friend request while you still can to Ralph Anthony Garcia on Twitter and Instagram at RGMC2407. Send an email to RGMC2407 at gmail.com where if you'd like to leave a small donation, please use the Zelle app or paypal.me for slash RGMC2407 or the Cash app. My cash Hashtag is RGMC2407. You may also connect with me on my other channel, the music channel, at RGMC2407. And right here on TURN, tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you, and I love you like cooked food. I will see you folks next time for the conclusion of this Sister Soldier miniseries on Ralph Reed's. Please take care out there. I mean, she has a good job, and her address is right here on her LinkedIn page. Yeah, guys, I don't think it's her. But the phone's in her bag. Try to act like she didn't know it was there, but she knew. Mm, I don't think so. She's nice. You think everyone's nice. I don't like the other two. Right? You saw how crazy she got when she thought she was in my picture? Girl, my followers ain't even thinking about you. Your followers ain't even thinking about you. 